Hey, everybody, welcome. We will get started here in just a few minutes. I need a, a minute to round up some maintainers here. We are supposed to have a vote on this call and we need some people to vote. All right, I found some of them. Hey, Enrique, are you good to demo the thing that we had chatted about um, webhooks and retries and stuff? Yeah, yeah, I'm good to demo. Okay, cool. We will uh, get a little bit of a late start today, but we'll uh, kick that off in just a minute.
All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for attending today's Firefly community call. I'll go ahead and share my screen here real quick and let me briefly go over the agenda. All right, uh, as all Hyperledger meetings, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, please take a look at the Hyperledger antitrust policy and code of conduct. This meeting will be held in accordance with those. Uh, this is being recorded, and the recording will be made publicly available on this page after the meeting. So if you want, if you missed the meeting and want to go back, or if somebody else wants, I guess if, if you're here, you won't miss the meeting, but if somebody else wants to go back, they can see the recording of it. Uh, today's agenda items, we have a vote to bring on some new maintainers. Uh, we have a demo for some new features that have been merged into mainline, and uh, we have some some architectural changes that we wanted to talk about that uh, include some significant performance improvements as well. So that is the agenda for today's call. Um, we're going to start today's call with a vote. So last community call, there was a motion to bring on uh, Chung and Matthew as maintainers. They have been uh, Contributing to Hyperledger Firefly for quite a while now and made some, some very meaningful contributions in uh, EVM Connect, in Firefly Core, and other places in the project, and uh, have, have really demonstrated a uh, great, great thought leadership in the project, uh, a strong grasp of the architecture, and have really dove uh, deeply into some of the, the most complex code in the project to improve it. And so uh, I I put forward their names last week as, as recommendations to add them to the maintainers list. And uh, we'll, we'll just, the, the process says that we need to vote on the next community call. So we'll just take a quick vote. Uh, if you guys just want to put in chat uh, either, either yes or no to bring on, I, I guess uh, we'll, we'll vote on them uh, separately. So yes for each one and, and no for each one uh, in the chat. And uh, I, I do believe we have a quorum of the maintainers here on the call. So we'll be able to wrap this up right here and now. Just a, another minute here. We're uh, working through some Zoom logistics. Sorry, there's a, a few of us just happen to be in the same room here. Apologies. So this is Peter here. So I think there's a motion to add new members to the community. And we're um, always there. First the motion for how do we like we're recording somewhere that there's a that there's an agreement that we're not just doing yays and nays on the call. There's going to be somewhere we're recording it. The, the call is recorded. Super. Okay, so it's a yay or nay from the maintainers. So yes. just go down the list of maintainers 
Yes. You know, you know, Nico had said chat, but we can do verbal if verbal is better. Do verbal. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me either way. Yeah. So do you want to call out? So where, I have the link to okay. this to go to go let through. Me, let me be the MC here. Who's going to motion for for this? I, I, I have a made, motion. Yes, I, I motion to bring on Matthew and Chang as maintainers to Hyperledger Firefly. Great. Anyone second? In second. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So now I'm going to do a roll call. Uh, you already. So, okay. So, so when we yes. so so we're roll calling through a list of maintainers. Yes. So where's the list of maintainers? List of maintainers is this is good practice. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah. Um, list of maintainers is this is the quality content that people join the Firefly. I'm using Firefly. A resident TSC members guide us to do this all the time. Um, maintainers .nd. Okay. First one, Peter, how do you vote? Yeah. Okay. Second, Nico, how do you vote? Yes for both. Third, um, Andrew, how do you vote? Yes for both. Great. So I assume, Peter, that your yay was for both. For well. both, yes, okay. sorry. Last one, Alex, how do you vote? Yes for both. Okay, great. So this is the maintainer, uh, according to Farfly. We don't care about the other maintainers or co-owners from other repositories, right? Uh, I, I I believe we so this is a uh, I, I believe we do because there are other maintainers of other um, of other repos within the the larger okay. Firefly project. Which other repos should I also look Sorry, at? just to check. So um, so Firefly is everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we're talking about maintainers of the core repo inside of Firefly was the specific. I think maintainers is a project wide title. Okay. Yes. And code owners is a yes. repository wide title. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about maintainers voting on new maintainers. And that list is uh, the question from me to you guys is is the list of maintainers for the whole project recorded in one place or is that um, aggregation from multiple places? I, I believe there, I thought there was a GitHub group, a GitHub team that had all of them in there, but I, now that I'm looking at it, it looks like there are, for instance, Matthew's already in the group that I thought was was the group. Mm, okay. So how about this? Um, I th so, so I think we should just we should just part this. Um, if that's so I apologize. I feel like I've disrupted the meeting. I didn't mean to. Um, I think we could very easily complete this in Discord. We've got a set of yays and a set of maintainers. We really positive thing and I've disrupted through procedure and I apologize for that. Um, and we'll just close out in Discord with what the list is, where the list is of the maintainers that's being updated and how that's going to get updated. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds good. So I we're saying uh, we'll, we'll continue the motion, but the list will be decided in Discord. Is that right? I think it's just too disruptive to not have the list known right now. What I heard was mm -hmm. When voting on adding people to a list of Firefly maintainers, yes, we're not one hundred percent confident we have a list oh, of Firefly, Firefly containers. containers because Firefly is yes. a microservice mm -hmm. architecture mm -hmm. with lots of repositories. We're very, very clear on the process for how you become a maintainer on an individual repository. I would say a code owner on one of those. Yeah, code owner on one yep. of those repositories. But um, but a little bit of lack of clarity just here right now on the call that's disrupting the call. And I want to just get past disrupting the call um, of what the list is that we're adding. Discord is probably the place that has the best list of project wide Firefly maintainers that is maintained by Hyperledger. So Discord may be the appropriate place for multiple reasons to finish. Okay. This. So we just want to make sure. Uh, we're going to decide who the maintainer list, the current maintainer is, are. We're just going to continue the conversation in this then, And then decide, because are we going to resume the, the motion in a second? We need to make sure that's a complete process. Yeah. So we're, we're discarding the current motion. Is that right? I, yes, I believe the proposal is to table the current motion until okay. we have the full list we're established. Gonna, we, we and, and we're going apologies for the Discord. 10 minutes we spent on it. Let's get on to the interesting stuff on the call. Um, and Jim will, Jim will work with Nico to help work out 
for procedural side yeah. of what we think is a very straightforward motion that we should be able to. This is part of the procedure. We're we're basically saying the current motion is is discarded. Okay, so we need to put a dis disposition to the current motion. It's discarded and it's going to be restarted in Discord. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, good. Good. Excellent. Great. Apologies. This is why I'm not in politics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now moving on to the exciting topics. Uh, Enrique, I believe you have a demo that you wanted to show on the call. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see it. Yeah. All right. So I think over the past few weeks, um, we've added some enhancements for the webhooks. Um, I, I sat here a month ago in the call and we showed the MTLS configuration for webhooks. And now we've added um, the two things. One is we've exposed um, a set of configurations that allows you to um, configure retries uh, for the HTTP requests for webhooks um, for the transfer layer for eventing as part of your subscription. And we've also exposed a set of um, HTTP configurations and options for timeouts, um, et cetera, and I'll show in a second. Um, and then the final thing as well that we added was the ability to batch events. Um, so this is a PR that's currently just on um, open just to update the documentation, but the code is already in. Um, and the idea is that you will be able to, as part of one HTTP call um, for the web folks, you will be able to batch a set of events um, as an array instead of having one HTTP request um, for each event that gets produced um, from the Firefly nodes. And with that, it's just a Boolean that you set to true as part of your subscription. And then there's also a timeout that allows you to configure, hey, if the batch hasn't been filled in the last X time, three, five, six seconds then just send regardless one to n events that you've configured. Um, so let me quickly demo that. Um, so I have a Firefly instance running locally. Um, let me just quickly close this. I have a Firefly instance running locally and I've just created a subscription. Uh, so let me just get the subscriptions again. This is quite small. So let me know if you want me to zoom in maybe a little bit. Um, so I've created a subscription called demo call, transport as webhooks. And inside the options, I've enabled batching to be true. I've enabled the timeout to be five seconds. I've also enabled a set of HTTP connections options. So connection timeout, I expect to continue timeout. Don't worry, these are all documented um, as part of the configuration section in the subscription as well. So you can go there for more detail. And then the thing that configures the batch size, and this is, I guess, from legacy um, point of view, is the read ahead. So the read ahead will specify what is the amount of events that we want to send, the max amount of events that we want to send in one HTTP call. So this would be, again, an array of events um, for the events that produce in Firefly. The other thing I've added is a retry section as well. So if, for example, if there is a deadline, context deadline, or there's a timeout problem, or my service is not available, I will try five times the HTTP call. And you can specify here an initial delay. So the first time I fail, I'll, I'll initially have five, and then the max delay will be a minute. And this will just back off exponentially increase until the max delay, and it will try five times. And I just have a, a dummy express server running locally, port 3000 that just out, outputs to adjacent payload to the console. Um, that it gets. So, um, so this is the the Node.js app. So let me um, remove it for a second, so it's so it's not running. I then have my VS Code terminal running the, one of the Firefly nodes, and then the other Firefly nodes are running in Docker. And let me go ahead and just execute a function, a contract. This is just a dummy contract that has an owner function. Um, that it will just return me the owner of this um, of this contract. So if I go and execute that, and I go back to my logs, you should see here, let me zoom in a little more, um, a retry happening. So the retry, so you'll see why there are two. So because there's a confirmation event, right? And transaction events, there are two events being produced, and you can see a retry is happening here. If I now go ahead and run that app, you'll straight away see the events. 
And because of the batch in timeouts and because of the retry, you might get only a single event um, per call, depending on, on how many requests you've done, basically. So, and if I go ahead and, and query it multiple times, let's say loads of people are concurrently executing different contracts, firing loads of events. If I click on it a few times, and this will execute loads of events, right? You should see a set of batch. So I'm gonna to have to scroll up a little bit because I've clicked it a bit way too much, but hopefully you can see this. So let's just get this array, for example. You'll see an event, secrets 313, which is quite a large event, frequency 314, another event here. Let me zoom in a little bit. 314, 315, and so on until you reach 3117, which is five. And that will close the array and then we'll we'll keep going. So it might be sometimes that depending on the timeout, you might we might say between one and five if the batch hasn't filled. Um, so yeah, that's that's the idea. Um, you can now have more fine-grained control of your webhooks from an HTTP point of view with retries and options, and also the ability to batch so you, you're not firing thousands of requests, one for each event. Um, yeah, that's about it. Any questions, any comments, I guess, from anyone? I think Peter really helped me on this feature, so if there's anything I missed, feel free to intervene, and you know, any questions from anyone, happy to answer them. So the read-ahead option is the maximum number of events that may end up in a batch? Yes, correct. Okay. That makes sense. Cool. Any other questions on the demo? All right. Thank you, Enrique. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. All right, I believe the next item on the agenda is uh, PostgreSQL for EVM Connect and performance enhancements. Peter, did you um, did you want to talk about that today? Yes. So um, there's there's been a lot of um, work over the last, I guess, between the last call and this one um, yeah. on the internal core. Um, it's all part of, really, I think, quite an exciting release, 1.3, when it comes out. There's a lot inside of there. I think Andrew's been talking about on previous calls, changes around how to pin private data and um, uh, our broadcast data to, um, to any kind of um, uh, smart contract invoke, There's changes around the token connectors. Um, there's then also another round, which I'm very involved in, of just the internal guts of the engine, the most important bits that run at scale in production for many projects today, um, taking a step forwards. And um, the two things I want to talk about here today, one is related to high availability, has a performance side effect, and the other is really related to, to performance. The first is that the blockchain connector. So you've got Firefly, it's got Core, which is the um, scalable engine that has the API service area and the event bus inside of it. And then that one engine can talk to lots of different blockchains across lots of different namespaces. But each, each one of the blockchains you're talking to, you have a connector to the blockchain. Um, we have a connector building toolkit, which has a Git. Um, repo inside of there called Firefly Transaction Manager, which is the one I'm going to talk about most here. And, the, and there's actually a few generations of connectors, but the latest generation of connectors are all built on this Firefly Transaction Manager toolkit. That Transaction Manager toolkit, that for example, the latest generation Ethereum connector, EVM Connect, is based on, um, has to reliably guide transactions onto the blockchain and reliably detect events from the blockchain. For that reason, the, these connectors need to have state. They need to be stateful. They need to track that data over time. And um, until just recently, Firefly Core, when it was storing data, was storing all of its data in a pluggable database. So Postgres is the most popularly used um, today, but a pluggable database, which means that the runtime itself is stateless, 
gives it a path towards active active, which is another thing we're working on for 1.3. So you can have um, very efficient failover. If you're doing a cloud environment, you can fail over between the availability zones, um, and you can reconnect to your database and continue where you left off. The, the Ethereum connector and the Firefly Transaction Manager Toolkit, however, were not using a database. They were using a very simple, efficient um, file-based store called LevelDB. It's very popular in the blockchain space because a lot of the blockchain technologies themselves build on top of LevelDB or technologies like RocksDB that are very similar to LevelDB. It's just a way to have a key value store on a file system. It's got a couple of challenges though. It's a file system. So if you want to make it highly, highly available, you have to make the file system highly available. That's very challenging for anyone who does cloud-based deployments. The other problem is it doesn't support rich query. So if you want to do things like, please find the last 500 transactions a week ago that um, are still waiting to be submitted to a chain, um, that are on their way through dealing with some complicated gas management thing with some public chain. That's a very hard um, query to construct in a database. You need a lot of code, basically, on top of a, of a, a key value store um, to implement each of the, each of the queries. So, so the, the piece of work that's happened is to take um, the transaction object which is stored inside of the connectors, inside of the Firefly Transaction Manager base toolkit, and all of the connectors that build on top of that, which includes the EVM connector, to take this data structure and all of the other data structures, like the list of event streams, the checkpoints for the event streams, and the, and the like, and instead of storing them, only having the option as level DB, local file system, to provide an alternative option of a database. And it is only at the moment the, the function that's supported for Postgres because that's the primary one that we see people using. So I'm going to focus in this session not on all of those other ancillary bits of data. I'm going to focus on the transaction object because it's the most interesting one in the system. The transaction object, and this is actually a level DB um, API that I'm calling against. And this is, um, uh, so I, I work in Glido. We, we have an enterprise stat that sits on top of the enterprise source. So if you see some, some things in the URL which aren't obvious from the from the from just the open source um, as to where you're getting to this, it's because you're getting to it from one of those enterprise stacks. Um, but this, this payload that you're looking for, looking at in front of you, is the open source payload from Firefly Transaction Manager in level DB today. And um, you'll see every transaction has an ID. Okay, now this is not the same as the transaction hash of the transaction on the blockchain. Because the whole point of this connector is to take thousands of API calls coming in concurrently, accept them, and then drip feed them onto a blockchain. Maybe the blockchain can only do 100 transactions a second. Maybe it's a public blockchain, you could do gas management, nonce management. It's going to be drip feeding them even slower than that onto a, um, onto a public chain. Maybe it's going to take minutes or hours for each one of these transactions to get submitted. And it's going to have to be reformed five, ten times with different gas prices to get it onto the blockchain. So every transaction gets assigned a unique ID. In the Firefly um, parlance, this is actually the namespace followed by the operation ID inside of Firefly. They get combined together at the blockchain layer because one blockchain connector can be used for multiple Firefly namespaces. So they get munched together inside of the ID of the transaction. And you've got the creation time and the updation time. And then there's a life cycle to this, which is over time, it's going to progress towards done. Hopefully. It might end up with fail if you have a transaction that gets submitted onto a blockchain successfully, but the blockchain rejects it for some reason, such as it was an invalid blockchain transaction. But the um, idea is that this is progressing everything at scale to succeed it. Um, you've got the from details, the two details, the, the, the nonce that's been assigned. These things actually change as the engine is updating this. It's assigning the nonce based on all of the transactions that are coming into this. They're, they're being pushed into the, the, the system. This data structure gets stored. 
Now, so that's what this data structure is. It's got a whole bunch of sections inside of it. And in level DB, what was happening was this whole big data structure with everything inside of it was getting stored in one go as a document inside of level DB is just a key value store as a document database. Um, so one of the big changes that's happened with the movement to um, having the option of Postgres, which is a relational database as well, is that all of the substructures inside of here, such as once it's made it to succeed in, it's darn well going to have a receipt from the blockchain. It's going to have a transaction hash. It's going to have all of the extra information that's part of the receipt. These substructures are now separately stored in separate database tables. And what that means is that it's much more efficient when you're working with a um, relational database to have small database tables with, lot, with small numbers of columns that you're, um, you're only updating those smaller, smaller um, records each, each time. So splitting this out was quite a big piece of work. You'll actually find it was quite a, it was like a 10,000 line code change in the end to the connector to make this change happen, the restructure happen that inside of the connector to separate these out. And it still works the same way for level DB. So it's still one big fat document in level DB, but internally the code's being restructured so that all of these can be separate. And for Postgres, the receipt's separate. There's also then these history entries, and these are really, really, really useful. If you imagine a transaction going on this journey from I'd like this transaction to come in. I've told an API call, you know, that's happening at scale, at off-chain, um, web to, to speed. Bang, yes, I've got this transaction. I'm guiding it through to the job blockchain. I might be making tens or hundreds of API calls to a blockchain to get this transaction on. So there are history records that get built up with the transaction. With level DB, we have to sort of compact these and munch them together to make sure the single document didn't grow too large. In Postgres, each one of these history records and actually different policy engine implementations, the open source one and um, companies like Pilo do, do, do add um, extra features on top. Um, every one of those records now is a separate record. It can be searched, it can be filtered inside of the Postgres um, format. So that's a really big step forwards when you're diagnosing problems, that you're able to look back to this history. It's not limited. There are thousands of entries inside of it. You can look for an individual transaction, exactly how many times have I submitted it? What transaction hashes did it get allocated as I was, I don't know, increasing the gas price and resubmitting it? So that's a really big benefit of the of the um, the change, and then um, there's another data structure which isn't included in this, which is about confirmations. If you're working with public blockchains, then um, as transactions you submit them, the first thing that happens is they get formed into a block, but that block may not be the final block in a public blockchain, which is actually where the transaction ends up, because blockchains can fork. So, so the way that you get finality in a chain like public mainnet Ethereum is different to if you're running a BESU chain between um, with you know up to 15 validators where they're doing a three-phase commit between those validators. Once it's in a block in a BESU um, QBFT chain, it's final straight away. That in a public chain, finality is actually about risk over time. How many blocks? have happened after the block that the transaction went into that confirm that it's really there. And that's configurable in the, in the blockchain connectors built on the FFTM toolkit. Um, uh, so each one of these confirmations, with, with the level D implementation before the we factor, you only got to see the confirmations at the end. If you're setting this to a number like 50 or so, which is quite common for a public main never, um, uh, like Ethereum, it means you don't get very much update as things are happening. So with this change, and this did get back ported to level DB as well, the confirmations, which are another substructure, what blocks is it in, what blocks came after it, the train of blocks that happened after this, they're also another substructure with a sub API, you can query them. So quite a big change that goes beyond just, it's, it's Postgres now, so high availability tick, you can fail over. Actually, really big steps forwards. We did a whole bunch of additional performance testing on the blockchain connector itself. Um, uh, 
it is able to quite easily outpace the blockchain themselves. So it's about efficiency um, and latency, and we've got a lot of improvements there. Um, uh, and but you know, TPS is really still limited by the blockchain, so it's about efficiency. Um, um, but um, so a lot of a lot of that sort of re-engineering happened inside, and there's some really nice quality of life features if you do make the move to Postgres, which query these substructures, um, the ability to search for those previous transactions over over time. I'm, I'm going to just before I move on to the other performance enhancements inside of inside of Firefly. Um, I know a lot of what I've given has really been just an overview again of the way the connectors work. I wanted just to point at where to go and learn a little bit more um, about this. Um, so the, the main PR for this, and there were some follow-ons, including a migration tool. Can't forget the migration tool, very helpful. If you have a level DB set of transactions inside of them and some of them are pending, or you want to keep that transaction history, there is a migration tool that you can use to migrate all of that data to Postgres. So that's, that's a useful one. Um, the, the main PR to look at is this one, the persistence has, uh, enhancements, including any PostgreSQL. You can see this was actually quite a long running um, branch, um, had quite a lot of, lot of input along, it, along its journey. This, this did stay out for a few weeks before it went into the main line. And it's quite a chunky one. There are a few changes to the interface for plugging in policy engines. So this is going to be a 1.3 um, release when, when it finally turns into a release at the blockchain connector level. There's already a release at the Fire, Firefly Transaction Manager level, which is the toolkit on which you build um, connectors. So there's going to be a new release of EVM Connect um, very soon, pulling this in, which is going to be a 1.3 release, which is ahead of where Core is. Core is still in mainline ahead of the first release candidate for 1.3. But because the connector toolkit has some breaking changes, we're going to go to 1.3 there. Um, uh, so have a look at this if you're interested in what those breaking changes are. And then just the last thing I'm going to mention, because it's a segue into the next, the next bit on performance in core, and then I'll promise I'll pause for questions, then there's been lots of information here. Um, the, the code base of Firefly Transaction Manager now, if you have a look inside of the internal persistence layer, you'll see that there's the persistence interface inside of here. And on the persistence interface, there's a split um, out between the core implementation that every persistence implementation, including level DB bus support. And then there's the rich query interface, which only rich query capable um, uh, in implementation support. There's a switch as to whether you support that on your plugin um, at the persistence layer. So if you start up your your connector with persistence to support rich query, you get a different set of the APIs will have a complete will have all the nice rich query capabilities that you're used to on core. You can you know do this contains this string or search by these five different fields in combination and sort send and descending like that full query syntax is only supported we've got rich query first thing to mention and then the second thing is if we go into the postgres branch you'll see one of the biggest li heavy lifting pieces here is um uh is in this code base there's a um a queue and a pool of workers that do the writing transactions now, this is one of the things that we've learned on the performance journey with Firefly in the 1.0 and 1.1 timeframe was if you're working with a relational database, really well understood pattern is if you do huge numbers of concurrent commits against the database, you thrash the database. So it's much better to have a pool of workers that do batch optimized inserts. So that practice is applied here. Um, and the reason why that's a good segue is because that's also what a lot of the practice has been on the next couple of revs um, of performance on core. So we'll come back to that in a second. Last bit of rambling for me before we get to just questions here on this item is um, to say 
at the level of the individual um, the individual objects which are stored inside of Postgres. For those of you who are active as maintainers in the Firefly code base, I think you might be really interested in a piece of work that happened a couple of months ago now in Firefly Common. Firefly Common, which is the toolkit for building microservices in Go, in the ecosystem of Firefly. So we use more microservice framework. There are, there are teams, um, including ones that I work with, uh, that are using this for other microservices as well. Um, it used to be a lot of boilerplate code to work with databases. There's now using the new Go 1.18 and later generics interface, there's something called a CRUD base class. And the only code needed to implement a complete create, retrieve, update, delete with filtering, this is the sum total of the code that's needed for a, a collection inside of, inside of um, building a new, new interface. So if you're if you're building anything in the ecosystem and you're looking to build REST APIs on top of the database, have a look at this stuff because it does massively reduce the amount of boilerplate code. Okay, lots of information from me. Um, before I just move on to some of it'll be a shorter topic, the performance enhancements on core. Any questions on where we are with the blockchain connector, the 1.3 rebase, and Postgres? Maybe uh, it's not that related, but just curious if uh, distributed tracing uh, was included or not. That's a great question. So, um, yes, in that um, the core Firefly open source package contains the tools for distributed tracing. Nico implemented those. I believe they're in 1.2.1 or are they only in the 1.0, the main line? Uh, they, they've been in several releases now, so. Super. Yeah. So, so if you're using the 1.2 release, what you will find is the first microservice that you come into in the Firefly ecosystem will allocate to the REST API call, will allocate a, 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 a unique request ID. And that request ID will be passed using a particular header to all of the other microservices, including the blockchain connector and included in all of the logs of that blockchain connector. And even more than that, if you want to, the external um, REST API of Firefly will allow you to pass that header in. So if you've got like an application stack sitting on top of Firefly, you can generate an API request ID in your application, pass that into Firefly, and that ID will go all the way through whatever the REST API chain is until that one REST API request is completed. So that's the foundations of a distributed tracing. How you integrate the Firefly deployment that you're doing with your logging infrastructure to, to maintain that. I obviously know how we do it in Colido for our customers and how we do it um, for, our, for our SaaS and our enterprise. Um, offerings, including the software offering, but um, but, but the, the open source community isn't isn't opinionated about how you do that. We just provide that request ID through. There, there's also another field. So, for instance, if you need to send a if there, if there's another piece of software that's setting an additional header that you want to pass through to all of the other microservices, there is a, a configuration option to enable that functionality as well and, and list a set of headers, custom headers that you want passed through to all the other microservices with the request. I, I just, mm -hmm. I, I do, do you want to just mention that no overlapping feature as well? Just sorry that I'm mentioning a few things in one. So we've got request IDs for an individual REST API call but sometimes your business transaction is actually all the way to the end of getting it onto the blockchain, which is an asynchronous activity that has to be traced through. And you might have reliability retry that you need to do because it's a REST API. REST APIs can, can break when I'm submitting it, get a timeout or whatever. You don't know where you submitted it or not. I want to just remind everybody about the feature of um, Firefly, which is item potency keys, and just point out there's a new doc section in head which really talks through the end-to-end -end of how item potency keys work. And they're not the same as the request ID I mentioned earlier, which scopes to one REST API call. 
they span across the whole of the business transaction, getting them all the way onto the blockchain. Yeah, got it. Thank you. It was helpful. Uh, still, there is one additional on, on that topic. Uh, basically, as you're batching, uh, like for example, set of transactions into a single invocation, uh, like to reduce the like, the amount of calls and uh, between services, like that distributed tracing. Then, I mean, uh, if it's only based on that, uh, like restful uh, modification, then uh, is there any way to achieve then the so, tracing multiple requests yeah if they're batched yes so the the um the okay the um feature that you're talking about for batching is specific to if you're using another feature of Barclay, which is the ability to do off-chain data transfer attached to blockchain transactions it's just one feature of barclay so i just want to point out for anyone else listening that batching capability is specific to if you're doing off-chain data transfer across the pipes for firefly and in that case you can have a pinning transaction that's actually pinning 100 off-chain transfers very efficient um, in that case, the unique ID of each of your payloads is the message UUID. The message UUID is the one that should be tracked all the way through. So mm -hmm. um, it's probably a detailed conversation to go into exactly the detail there. But when I'm diagnosing an issue which is related to wh where's my message, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the message ID is usually the one that I use in order to trace because the message ID, the great thing is that will go all the way through to the other side as well. So if you've got two parties involved with two copies of Firefly, one on the sending side and one on, on the receiving side, or maybe there are five receivers in a privacy group, you should, you'll see the same UUID for that message appear in the logs on all of those, all of those parties. Right. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great question. Any any more on just we did start with blockchain connectors, so I guess sort of back to the blockchain connectors. Any more on blockchain connectors or the Postgres um, migration, an option of a migration that's coming in one dot three? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, after rolling out this feature, uh, will we have this option as an optional i mean we can configure in this is in connector uh files uh if we want to use level db or we will use postgres yeah yes so that is available in mainline today if you're interested in experimenting with the feature it's in mainline there isn't yet um a, a developer um flag on the developer cli to say my development environment on my laptop, I'd like to stand it up um, using the Firefly CLI with Postgres for the connector. That's an option that um, we would like to get in in the 1.3 release is to be able to create a development environment with, with, um, a Firefly, with Postgres. Um, it's also not the case that the Helm charts, which are the basis for if you're not using, you know, a company like Clido with an enterprise software offering around this, you're, you're sort of building a deployment yourself um, based on the open source uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. There's no example in there as to how you set the configuration. So it's there in the documentation, also generated from the config, um, uh, how you configure it. It's You can do it today, but the, the accelerators to make it really easy um, are, not, are not there yet. Uh, but we do expect those close out as part of the 1.3 release. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you also mentioned the breaking changes and after rolling out this feature, uh, let's imagine that, for example, I implement the, uh, another connector that uses uh, existing transaction transaction manager, yeah? And should I uh, implement the new APIs that you uh, showed us or uh, it, it will be backward compatible? Um, so if you've built um, what's called a policy engine plugin for the Firefly Transaction Manager toolkit, 
Um, the policy engine plugin has an interface to the rest of the toolkit that includes the transaction history um, updating. Um, and that API, it's not changed really significantly, but there were a couple of changes that we just couldn't avoid. So there will be a little bit of code change needed in your policy engine if you've implemented one. If you haven't implemented a policy engine, you've just implemented the Firefly C API, Connector API, connected to the backend blockchain, you're using the simple policy engine. The simple policy engine that comes in the open source has, has been updated to new APIs. So you'll, you'll have the new simple policy engine and that's automatically been updated as part of the um, as part of the work here, and it's not a big change. You don't have to implement something that new. It's just a couple of changes, really quite small ones, to that. It's called the toolkit API that gets passed into the policy engine. It's just a, a few subtle changes on there. I don't think it will be a really big piece of work, um, but it is you is required um, to be able to recompile with the one lot code base. You won't be able to compile your existing policy engine against the um, the, the new uh, toolkit um, without making those few code changes. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Just a, a quick time check. Yeah, sorry, I've been on for a yeah. while. <laughs> no, I, great, great questions though, and I really appreciate the uh, the just the the conversational aspect of it. So let me just spend maybe just one or two minutes. I'm going to spend lots of time just talking about a couple of the big changes that have gone into the guts of Firefly Core. Um, so they're of a very similar ilk. They're of a very similar ilk to things that we did in the 1.0 and 1.1 um, performance optimization runs. So there's nothing revolutionary here. But these were actually well understood, um, the bits of work that hadn't happened yet. And we wanted to get them ticked off. And we wanted to get them ticked off um, ahead of doing the active active um, heavy lifting work, which is um, sort of started in the 1.3 timeline, but it's probably the biggest piece of the 1.3 release that's not, not closed out yet. Um, so uh, the first is when you're doing, you're not using the messaging capabilities at all, or you're using messaging with custom smart contracts. You're just trying to submit transactions at volume. You know, you're trying to get your Hyperledger Fabric chain to submit 500 transactions a second, or you're trying to get, you know, reliably 100 TPS out of your your um, Ethereum um, blockchain. Um, and you just and you care about each individual um, smart contract in bulk. You're not using any of the other fancy features of Firefly. You're just generating REST API, signing and submitting at scale. Um, we found that we were just starting to hit against a couple of bottlenecks. One is on the way in, um, the way that we were inserting into the database each transaction as it comes in with the item potency. So that, um, that is what this one is, 1354, was a recently chunky piece of internal, doesn't change any function, just a, an optimization exercise on how we're using the database, a new pool of writers that's about writing transactions and operations um, that are part of the, those invokes. Um, and we found that made a really big step. Um, hard to notice on Ethereum, but if you are, if you are dealing with something which is um, uh, sort of more of a DLT layer than a, than 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 you know one of these um, Byzantine um, uh, uh, blockchains we're connecting to. If it's something more like integrating to a fabric or a cord or whatever, and you're 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 looking to sort of pump really high volumes in, this is a really really good one for you. Um, and then the other one was doing exactly the same on the way back. When we're when we're in taking events, and this actually does affect Ethereum because you can listen to lots of events from Ethereum. Firefly has to obviously deliver those events to you in sequence, which means that there's actually, unlike a lot of things that you can solve with parallel scale, for events, we have to be very careful on ordering. So we actually did a lot of code path optimization to, um, to insert into the database in batches. So you can have the connectors um, a very efficient uh, receiving batches from the blockchain. So receiving batches of events, doing a checkpoint recovery of those events from the blockchain. Then pass those batches to core as a batch, maybe through the token connector in the middle, maybe not. 
and then to make sure the core was processing them as a batch. Um, and that batch processing was less efficient than it should have been. So um, this actually made quite a big difference if you're different, even with Ethereum, if you're dealing with model event streams, um, you can actually quite quickly get to a really high volume of events that you want to index for a blockchain. So this is this, I think, is um, going to be really helpful for everyone when, when this is there in the sort of mainstream for everybody with 1.3. And that really is it from me. Sorry for talking awesome. a bit today. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate the, uh, I know there, were, there was a lot to, uh, like you said, <laughs> a little ten, over 10,000 lines of code to, to, to talk about there. So, um, yeah, we've got just a couple minutes left. I will open it up at this point for any other questions or topics that people may want to chat about regarding related to Firefly. The floor is open at this time. Uh, actually, I have one problem uh, which I am currently resolving. So, if, uh, would like to maybe someone can help with that. Basically, we stood up a staging environment with uh, chain code as a service, and uh, uh, basically that's the fabric uh, uh, chain there, and we are using FabConnect. And basically, uh, we are using the Firefly message bus for uh, the SA, uh, event bus our uh, microservices basically and the problem is actually that events are uh, transmitted really slow uh, slowly through that message bus it takes like uh, maybe half a minute uh, for a emitted event to be consumed by a listener so uh, like uh, maybe you can give some direction uh, how it's better to troubleshoot that problem I, I think I saw a message on Discord uh, mm -hmm. that sounds very similar to this. At the yeah. that's just... actually the the message that I also sent there. Okay. That, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to look at this on Discord. Um, just a quick glance at the logs that you posted looks like that the fabric network itself is just very slow. Um, but we would, I'll, I'll be happy to dig into it maybe offline okay. there in Discord. Yeah. Sure. You probably just mentioned for fabric. Um, uh, a few of us were actually doing some pushing hard on fabric networks recently. Um, yeah, I can't show all the members of the community but we're doing it. But anyway, there was, there was a really interesting collaborative exercise going on that happened to be related to fabric. And we did find an important bug in core to do with if there were hundreds or thousands of transactions inside of one block in fabric. Um, there was a clash of keys that was mm, that was happening. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing testing with Fabric, I think it's very important that you have that fixed. I don't believe that's in a 1.2.x release stream, even the 1.2.1 that we just released. I don't think it is. So it might be quite important. Maybe either Nico or Jim can help just join the dots on that um, on, on that issue. Yeah, maybe you're mentioning the unique constraint failing uh, this protocol ID, listener ID, and something else. Actually, that's uh, I've met previously, and I, I actually I was just uh, made a workaround by removing that unique constraint for the time being. Not sure if that's the same thing. Hey, uh, this is Jim. Uh, I'll sorry for missing your earlier ping on Discord. I'll take a look and see if there are other things uh, at play here. Uh, our experience is um, when you push the order really hard, um, events can be delayed, but it's usually by a couple of seconds uh, when the order is very busy cutting blocks, but seeing them getting delayed for a half minute, that's, um, that's quite strange. Uh, we'll help you take a look. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, actually, that's, uh, I mean, we are not putting much load, that's just... We initially stood it up and I'm testing basically that's like 10 events that are being pushed at uh, my almost at once. Okay, thanks, Sergei. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely take a look at that and get back to you on Discord. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. All righty, we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you all for coming out today. Thank you for. Uh, the great conversation, great questions, and for the, the content that was shown here today. 
If, you got, if anybody has further questions or other things that you want to chat about, uh, please feel free to jump into the Hyperledger Discord in the Firefly channel, and we'd be happy to catch up with you there. Uh, until next time, thanks, everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you.